Chapter 21 My dear Wormwood, Yes, a period of sexual temptation is an excellent time for working in a subordinate attack on the patient's peevishness. It may even be the main attack, as long as he thinks it is the subordinate one. But here, as in everything else, the way must be prepared for your moral assault by darkening his intellect. Men are not angered by mere misfortune, but by misfortune conceived as injury, and the sense of injury depends on the feeling that a legitimate claim has been denied. The more claims on life, therefore, that your patient can be induced to make, the more often he will feel injured and, as a result, ill-tempered. Now, you will have noticed that nothing throws him into a passion so easily as to find a tract of time which he reckoned on having at his own disposal unexpectedly taken from him. It is the unexpected visitor when he was looking forward to a quiet evening, or uh, the friend's talkative wife uh, turning up when he was looking forward to a tete-a-tete -tete with the friend that throws him out of gear. Now, he is not so uncharitable or slothful that these small demands on his courtesy are in themselves too much for it. They anger him, because he regards his time as his own, and feels that it is being stolen. You must therefore zealously guard in his mind the curious assumption, My time is my own. Let him have the feeling that he starts every day as the lawful possessor of twenty-four hours. Let him feel as a grievous tax that portion of this property which he has to make over to his employers, and as a generous donation that further portion which he allows to religious duties. But what he must never be permitted to doubt is that the total from which these deductions have been made was, in some mysterious sense, his own personal birthright. You have here a delicate task. The assumption which you want him to go on making is so absurd that, if once it is questioned, even we cannot find a shred of argument in its defense. The man can neither make nor retain one moment of time. It all comes to him by pure gift. He might as well regard the sun and the moon his chattels. He is also, in theory, committed to a total service to the enemy, and if the enemy appeared to him in bodily form and demanded that total service for even one day, he would not refuse. He would be greatly relieved if that one day involved nothing harder than listening to the conversation of a foolish woman, and he would be relieved almost to the pitch of disappointment if, for one half an hour in that day, the enemy had said, now you may go and amuse yourself. Now, if he thinks about his assumption for a moment, even he is bound to realize that he is actually in this situation every day. When I speak of preserving this assumption in his mind, therefore, the last thing I mean you to do is to furnish him with arguments in its defense. <laughs> there aren't any. Your task is purely negative. Don't let his thoughts come anywhere near it. Wrap a darkness around it, and in the center of that darkness, let his sense of ownership in time lie silent, uninspected, and operative. The sense of ownership, in general, is always to be encouraged. The humans are always putting claims to ownership, which sound equally Funny in heaven and in hell, and we must keep them doing so. Much of the modern resistance to chastity comes from men's belief that they own their bodies, those vast and perilous estates, pulsating with the energy that made the worlds, in which they find themselves without their consent, and from which they are ejected at the pleasure of another. It is as if a royal child, whom his father has placed for love's sake in titular command of some great province under the real rule of wise counsellors, should come to fancy he really owns the cities, the forests, and the corn, in the same way that he owns the bricks on the nursery floor. We produce this sense of ownership not only by pride, but by confusion, 
we teach them not to notice the different senses of the possessive pronoun, the finely graded differences that run from my boots through my dog, my servant, my wife, my father, my master, my country, to my god. They can be taught to reduce all these senses to that of my boots, the my of ownership. Even in the nursery, a child can be taught to mean by my teddy bear, not the old imagined recipient of affection to whom it stands a special relationship, for that is what the enemy will teach them to mean if we are not careful. But instead, the bear I can pull to pieces if I like. And at the other end of the scale, we have taught men to say, my God, in a sense not really very different from my boots, meaning the God on whom I have a claim for my distinguished services and whom I exploit from the pulpit, the God I have done a corner in. And all the time, the joke is that the word mine, in its fully possessive sense, cannot be uttered by a human being about anything. In the long run, either our father or the enemy will say, mine, of each thing that exists, and specially of each man. They will find out in the end, never fear, to whom their time, their souls, and their bodies really belong, certainly not to them, whatever happens. At present, the enemy says, mine, of everything on the pedantic legalistic ground that he made it. Our father hopes in the end to say, mine, of all things on the more realistic and dynamic ground of conquest. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.